Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this RegameTitle.com video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with AMD, specifically the fact that the company have confirmed that their roadmaps are on schedule, including the fact that the Zen 2 processors will be built on a 7nm process and their design is complete, and next-gen 7nm plus GPUs will be hitting store shelves by 2020. On addition to that... AMD's Zen 5 will be based on a 3NM process, according to rumours from Global Foundries. And staying on the topic of AMD, you might recall the Spectre Next Generation floor, which was discovered, which was confirmed to affect Intel processors. And now we have updated information that AMD are not affected by this particular floor. So this, at least for now, means they are in the clear. And then we're going to finish the video off with Samsung, because the company plan to become even more of a dominant player in the cell phone market by providing chips to rival cell phone manufacturers, including ZTE or ZTE, depending on which you want to pronounce it. Of course, AMD have been rather busy with announcements over the past couple of days, including the fact that second generation Ryzen Threadripper CPUs are now starting to sample, and the announcements for the Ryzen Pro Enterprise APUs. Just as a quick refresher, it looks like the Threadripper 2000 series, which no doubt will be headlined by the 16-core Threadripper 2950X, will undergo many of the same optimizations as the Zen Plus architecture, so of course this means latency optimizations and higher clock speeds. If you want more information on that, there is of course a video from a day or two ago which you can check out. Of course, the original Zen debuted a year ago, in 2017, and on a 14nm process. This has recently transformed to Zen Plus, which is on a 12nm process. And as I just mentioned with the Threadripper just a few seconds ago, we have improvements in the memory controller, the cache latency, intercore bandwidth, and various other things that I'm actually testing in a series of videos which are going to be up on the channel over the next few days. Although these updated roadmaps doubled down on what we already had heard from rumours. So the first thing is Zen 2 is going to be built on a 7nm process. That had of course been confirmed by AMD in the past, but the design is now completely finished. But what is certainly new information is that it says it improves on Zen in multiple dimensions. It would appear that each of these is a step for a year, so we can presume, therefore, that Zen 2 is going to be available in, well, let's say, a year's time. That means, most likely, I'm going to be bringing you a review of Zen 2-based processors in, most likely, April-ish next year. I'm just very briefly going to speculate on what that means by multiple dimensions. The most obvious one, of course, is improvements in power consumption and shock and horror clock speeds. I mean, I'm bringing you super important information there, right? That's pretty obvious. However, there's definitely going to be IPC improvements as well. Of course, what I'm about to say is pure speculation, but I imagine AMD are already setting its sights to improve intercore connectivity even further, particularly between CCXs perhaps improvements in branch prediction, perhaps improvements in AVX support like AVX 512. It's also slightly possible that we could see improvements by way of increased cache, possibly integer units, floating point operations, and so on. But of course, all of this is pure speculation at this point, so it would probably be slightly outside the remit of this video to continue. Now, you can read these slides as well when it comes to the GPU side of things in one of two ways. Assuming, once again, each of these steps is a year, then it looks like Vega is going to hit late this year or possibly early next year. It does tell us that the design is complete. Of course, Vega 14nm is the current product. My guess is, however, that we're not going to see Navi slip much later than say, the midpoint of 2019. Discussing Vega for a second, from what we understand, it still has 64 compute units. That means, of course, 4,096 shaders. Supposedly, the biggest difference would be, obviously, clock speed improvements, reductions in power consumption, and possibly a few bits and pieces added purely for uh, AI. There's a lot of discussion whether we're going to see some trickle-down effect from Vega 7nm to the regular consumer market, Honestly, and this is me purely speculating, this is certainly not an official rumour, but I wouldn't be surprised if we saw one of a couple of things happen. 
The first is that Vega became a 12NM product, which would certainly make sense. A lot of the perhaps compute functionality was stripped away, perhaps a few other tweaks here and there were made. Maybe even with uh, HBM2 removed, so it would become almost like a Polaris type of GPU. And that possibly could launch, let's say, the later part of this year. This is not, by the way, an official rumour or anything like that. This is not from industry insiders. This is just me speculating here. Of course, it would involve quite a lot of redesign. It would involve a completely different memory controller. But one of the problems at the moment with Vega, there's a couple of issues. One is the expensive nature of HBM. And the second, of course, is power consumption. One of the reasons that Vega is using HBM is because it hoovers down a lot of power. This could possibly be fixed, however, on a 12 and in process, but how much we don't know. But we do know, of course, GDDR6 is better in terms of power consumption, so possibly the two could somewhat cancel each other out with some other optimizations here and there, perhaps a couple of hundred megahertz bumped up for the clock speed but of course all of this is speculation the other possibilities we would see 7nm for gpus for you know gaming but i'm not 100 percent convinced on that i imagine it would be quite expensive but of course we don't know what the yields are obviously all of that is pure speculation navi however does appear to be on track it's going to be in 7nm one thing we do know is that it appears that Navi is going to have almost like a Zen-like design. In other words, it's going to be scalable. This essentially means it's going to be built in almost blocks, and therefore you can simply piece them together depending on the size and complexity and performance of the GPU. I'm in danger of repeating myself from about a week ago, but don't forget NVIDIA have actually conducted various simulations on their own GPU architectures, and it was found that if they did create a modular-based GPU, in other words, very similar to, let's say, how Intel and AMD are producing their CPUs right now, they could produce a, CPU, sorry, a GPU which is considerably more... Uh, uh, better in terms of performance, requires less power than any singular monolithic design that they can produce right now and even scales better than SLI. I also released a video a couple of days ago where I did an analysis of the next generation AMD architecture and it appears to be based on a super SIMD type of uh, construction. I don't want to go too deep into it in this video because I'm going to eat up way too much time. If you do want more information on that, you can check it out in the video description or you can simply search for it on the channel. It was only released a couple of days ago. But essentially what we have there is a, almost well, assuming that does turn out to be the architecture and it has been filed as a patent that's official. So it looks like the Super SIMD type of GPU is going to be a cross between what we have currently with the stream processor technology also known as single instruction multi-data, that's essentially what the architecture is. And of course, their previous GPUs before that, which would have been like the HD 6000 series, they were based on VLIW, very long instruction word, originally it started out as VLIW5, and then that was subsequently changed to VLIW4. And from once again, those patents, it would appear that AMD are going kind of like a cross between the two. In theory, this would drastically improve performance for gaming workloads and also compute-based workloads. It would almost be like the best of both worlds. Very brief synopsis right now for those who missed that video, and I would once again encourage you to check it out. But SIMD is really good for compute-based workloads. The problem is, however, gaming workloads, the size of the actual die itself, the power consumption, all of that stuff goes considerably higher. But with VLIW, it's not so good for compute-orientated functions. And obviously, we're now starting to get into the era where compute-orientated functions, even in games, is becoming pretty, well, synonymous with design. Therefore, it requires a lot of optimization from the compiler. And that's one of the reasons that AMD tweaked this. We also have news and slightly... Um, going back on ourselves to the CPU side of things, but I did want to separate them from stuff that had been officially released from AMD and some other comments from the CEO of Global Foundries, who is Tom Clawfield. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. He mentioned the fact that it appears that AMD are leaning towards the production for AMD Zen 5, just for clarification's sake, AMD are skipping Zen 4. Uh, there's a couple of reasons thought behind this but one of those is the fact that four is an unlucky number in china and it would just appear that amd are just skipping that so just to clarify there's zen the zen plus the zen 2 the zen 3 and then they're going straight to zen 5 so why are 
AMD skipping this? Well, it really comes down to global foundries. Global foundries are skipping 5NM because they don't feel it's worth the investment. And in fact, he said, and I quote, I don't know if 5NM is enough to make a fabulous company invest. That's AMD in this case. They need something as defined as 3NM to get full performance, but we're still looking at what might be the right, in right investment Excuse me, for the next node. And this was according to, once again, Tom Caulfield, who is once again the CEO of Global Foundries during an interview with EE Times. I also feel it's imperative to remind everyone that processes aren't necessarily the same between companies. Indeed, some chips with different packages, for example, APUs, can actually have different processes for different parts. And while I'm vastly simplifying it for the sake of this video, I have actually covered this in depth before. I'll link that in the video description. There is not exactly a standardized way to define a size of a node. Each company, you know, essentially pretty much just makes up as they go along. And in some cases, even if technically stuff is produced at the same size, other tweaks such as FinFET and so on can have a drastic difference. So what I'm essentially saying is you can't necessarily compare global foundries to Samsung and Samsung to Intel and so on and so on and so on. On a different subject, and that is Spectre Next Generation, it has been confirmed that AMD are not affected by the Spectre Next Generation flaw, which does affect Intel processors. Intel currently are rolling out patches and they're working on it, and apparently a couple of them are being delayed, but they will be um, released over the next several weeks. It's imperative to know that this is Spectre Next Generation. This was originally broke by Heiss.de, and according to them, researchers found at least eight security vulnerabilities in Intel processors, and obviously that wasn't particularly good. So what's the latest piece of news? Well, obviously at the time, everyone was kind of like, ah, no, the sky is falling. What situation are we going to be in? Well, according to AMD, they are not vulnerable. They have done their own independent tests, and it would appear that they have no exposure to the new Spectre next generation risks, which is obviously really good from their perspective. And while this might be bad for Intel in the sake of, let's say, us as regular customers, so gamers or content producers or 3D artists or whatever, it's really not good for them from the perspective of server markets or put it this way, com uh, companies and customers who are buying hundreds if not thousands of chips. AMD had originally planned to achieve about 5% server market uh, share by Q4 of this year. And of course, the fact that while Meltdown was an Intel uh, exclusive issue, Spectre had somewhat tapered AMD's celebrations because it essentially affected both AMD and Intel. But now, with Spectre Next Generation, AMD are not vulnerable. Therefore, it makes me wonder, and this is pure speculation, of course, whether the percentage of the server market AMD are going to gobble up is going to be a bit different. Not necessarily because companies are going to be like, nope, we're not going near Intel. More just somewhat to hedge their bets, essentially. Now, I will admit the fact that the Zen architecture is still kind of new, I wouldn't be surprised if there are bugs or vulnerabilities discovered which might be exclusive to them. <laughs> After all, we did hear about rise and fall. However, very fortunately for AMD, the research company, and I say that in very loose terms, which discovered these vulnerabilities did so in a very, at least in my opinion, biased fashion, and essentially required full machine administrative privileges, and subsequently AMD have patched this and there are no uh, f issues with performance. Performance degradation has not happened. And while this might seem a bit of an exaggerated parallel, it to me was a bit like the company claiming they can steal your car because of an extreme vulnerability in the system. And then what they do to then steal your car and prove this is by taking your keys from the coffee table that's right in front of you and then simply getting into your car and driving away. Because essentially if you had that level of administrative access, well yeah you've got other problems other than the uh, flaws that this company were uh, mentioning. 
The company, by the way, being CTS Labs. And final piece of news, and that would be Samsung. Because Samsung want to be Samsung. Um, of course, right now, Samsung are absolutely ginormous when it comes to their own set of cell phones. They've been in an internal battle with Apple. Okay, maybe that's slightly exaggerating. But still, the Galaxy S series versus the various iPhone lineups has been certainly something that has been a consistent question that I always seem to notice every 12 or so months when the new phones are released and someone's wondering whether they should upgrade their contract and whether to go with Android or uh, iOS. Currently, however, Samsung are producing its Exynos chips exclusive to their own products, so their own phones and tablets, but it wants to eat some of Qualcomm and MediaTek's pie. For those who are not too familiar with the mobile market, the Snapdragon series, for example, 845, is found in a lot of modern major Android phones today, including even the S9 Plus. There are only minute differences, actually, between Qualcomm's Snapdragon and Samsung's own chips. And while we can certainly argue all day long regarding the benchmarks, te technically speaking, generally, the Exynos chips are slightly faster in benchmark testing for synthetic results, but in real-world performance, it's pretty much, you know, interchangeable. There are a few differences when it comes to power consumption, and also the Samsung solution does not support HDR video recording, but Samsung might decide to produce these chips for ZTE, who are, of course, currently facing a seven-year ban on importing US technology, although this is a much larger story as a whole. But there are some updates that ZTE might actually have the ban overturned by the US government, and one of the reasons behind that is the sheer number of jobs which would be lost both in China and the US if... Uh, ZTE was essentially sentenced to death because obviously this would be pretty much a death sentence. Anyway, with all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Normal stuff. Like, share, comment, subscribe, and click the bell icon. Bye for now.